It played a pivotal role during the War of Independence against Dutch colonial rule. The Indonesian military continues to stamp its ascendancy in Indonesia's political and economic spheres during 32 years of Suharto's presidency. Dalam era Orde Baru, Presiden Soeharto sudah melihat nih, saya perlu dukungan kuat bagi rezim politik saya dan saya tidak bisa kalau saya tidak menggunakan abri pada waktu itu. The role of the Indonesian military in politics, however, came to an end with the fall of former President Suharto in May 1998. It also ushered in a new era of democracy in the country. Definitely from 1998. Uh, I believe the TNI leadership at that time felt that it had to make a clean break from the Suharto era in order to remain relevant to Indonesia. The purpose of our present, whether you are TNI or other, how to bring, uh, how to protect your own people. Indonesia, TNI, work very hard to protect the interests of the people of Indonesia. Today, the Indonesian military exists as a professional fighting force that's subservient to the civilian leadership. But how is Indonesia able to thrive as the world's third largest democracy, while several other countries fail. Indonesia. It's the world's largest and most populous Muslim nation. It also stands out as one of the most vibrant and successful cases of democratic transformation in Asia. For more than three decades, the people lived under the authoritarian rule of former President Suharto. Today, Indonesia has been transformed into a thriving democracy with political parties competing in the electoral process to earn the right to govern. The military, on the other hand, gave up its pervasive role in politics and business to become professional soldiers. But Indonesia's transition into democracy was fraught with numerous obstacles and challenges. Jakarta, 17th of August, 1945, the day when Indonesia's founding fathers, Sukarno and Muhammad Hatta, proclaimed Indonesia's independence. Kami, bangsa Indonesia, dengan ini menyatakan kemerdekaan Indonesia. Hal-hal yang mengenai pemindahan kekuasaan dan lain-lain diselenggarakan dengan cara saksama dan dalam tempo yang sesingkat-singkatnya. The historic event happened just days after atomic bombs were dropped on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The bombings of the two major cities effectively ended Japanese occupation in the archipelago from 1942 to 1945. But former colonial master, the Netherlands, refused to accept the independence proclamation and claimed sovereignty over Indonesia. As Dutch troops gradually returned to Indonesia, the war of independence broke out. Dan ingat bahwa perjuangan merebut kemerdekaan itu adalah sebuah gerakan politik. Sehingga satuan-satuan uh, pejuang kemerdekaan ini uh, sebagai sayap bersenjata dari gerakan politiknya, ini memang sudah mempunyai uh, ideologi politis. Ini semua harus disatukan karena kita harus punya sebuah uh, kekuatan pertahanan. Uh, dan menyatukan itu tidak mudah. Uh, terutama adalah dari 
satuan-satuan pejuang kemerdekaan yang memang sudah punya isi politik itu. It took four years of guerrilla war and diplomacy before the Dutch finally recognized Indonesia's independence in December 1949. But maintaining unity in such a vast country was a monumental task for President Sukarno and his government in the years after independence. It's home to hundreds of ethnic groups. In the 50s and early 60s, rebellions broke out in Java, the Moluccas, Sulawesi and Sumatra against the new republic. They were quickly crushed by the military. So throughout the 1950s, the military leadership had a, a, quite a difficult time trying to make the military into a, a more professional organization. And a lot of the uh, regional rebellions that we saw during that time, it's not, it's not necessarily the regions rebelling against the central government, but a lot of them were, you know, commanders rebellion. So there was a very complicated military, uh, in, intra-military politics at the time. And President Sukarno, if you look at the throughout the 1950s, he played politics also, you know, supporting one military leader against another. In Sukarno's guided democracy, religion, nationalism, and communism were blended into one concept to appease competing political, military, and religious forces. And in the mid-1960s, the Indonesian Communist Party, or PKI, had emerged as the world's third largest party outside the Soviet Union and China. By 1965, affiliated organizations of the PKI claimed a membership of 20 million people out of a population of around 100 million people at that time. Yang bisa saya tangkap dari fenomena yang ada di lingkungan sekitar adalah bahwa um, ada tiga kekuatan politik di situ. Satu adalah pastinya adalah Presiden Soekarno sangat karismatis hmm, pada waktu itu seolah-olah tidak tergantikan. Hmm. Yang kedua adalah Partai Komunis Indonesia, uh, partai yang sangat dekat dengan Presiden Soekarno. Mengapa itu sebuah kekuatan uh, politik seperti saya katakan? Ketika mereka merayakan hari ulang tahun uh, di Stadion Utama Senayan, itu Jalan Sudirman dan Jalan Tamrin penuh dengan bendera merah. It's a very unstable, triangular relations between Sukarno, uh, the, the army, and, and uh, the PKI. Uh, if you look at it, the uh, Air Force at the time was still very small. The Navy is, you know, very, very small. And the Air Force was considered to be, at the time, uh, closer to, to, to Sukarno. So, so this is the leftist, rightist uh, positions. And, uh, and during this time, of course, you know, because of the army was anti-communist, a lot of this Islamic interests, you know, were closer to the to the army because they were very opposed to uh, to, to 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 communism. By 1965, rumors were circulating in Jakarta that a group of senior army generals were planning a coup against Sukarno. Concerns over the president's health intensified after he collapsed at an event in August. Jadi angkatan darat mewaspadai langkah-langkah dari Partai Komunis Indonesia atau PKI ini. Ditambah lagi suasana yang membuat uh, keadaan itu mencekam adalah sakitnya Presiden Soekarno. Presiden Soekarno itu dirawat oleh sebuah tim dari uh, LRT dan tersiar. Ada sasus-sus, rumor bahwa sakitnya cukup parah dan bahwa Presiden Soekarno itu uh, bisa untuk uh, wafat uh, dalam waktu dekat ketika itu. Then, on the evening of September 30th, 1965, members of an armed group which called itself the 30 September Movement kidnapped and killed six of the most senior army generals and one lieutenant. The official Indonesian government version of the movement laid the blame squarely on the PKI. Retired General Agus Wijojo is the governor of the National Resilience Institute, 
a government think tank. His father, Major General Sutoyo Siswo Miharjo, was among the six high-level military officers who were kidnapped and killed in the attempted coup. Agus was only 18 years old and had yet to graduate from senior high school when unidentified troops entered the family house on the evening of September 30th, 1965. They ordered him and all his other siblings to stay in their rooms. Ayah itu masih mencuba untuk bertanya siapa ini, ada apa, katanya dipanggil presiden, tapi juga di situ tidak meyakinkan. Tetapi ketika mereka mulai merusak di dalam dan untuk apa, untuk menyelamatkan situasi, ayah saya keluar. Dan sejak itu saya tidak melihat lagi ayah saya. Ketika uh, ayah saya diculik dan tidak ada yang bisa memberikan penjelasan, uh, uh, apa, hubungan telepon juga sudah diputus. Uh, kita mencari penjelasan kemana-mana juga tidak uh, bisa. Uh, maka saya sudah apa, mempersiapkan diri untuk uh, kemungkinan terjelek. The attempted coup was blamed on the now defunct Indonesian Communist Party or PKI which teamed up with conspirators from within the army. It was quickly quelled by Suharto on October the 1st, then head of the army's strategic command. The rise of General Suharto also led to the brutal anti-communist purge in Indonesia and the decimation of the largest communist party outside of China and the Soviet Union. How and why did he do it? Suharto's rise to power in March 1966 was preceded by one of the darkest and most brutal chapters in Indonesian history. The coup attempt in 1965 was seen as a plot by the Communist Party to seize power in the country. And that prompted him to react and neutralize the threat. He then embarked on a nationwide purge against suspected communists and their sympathizers. The number of deaths was staggering. Up to one million people were believed to have been killed between October 1965 and early 1966. Even today, the actual number of victims is still being disputed. It began when some army officers, battalion, kidnapped and killed several army generals in Jakarta and Yogyakarta. That triggered an anti-communist campaign, initially in Java, but later to Bali, uh, Sumatra, and at the later stage, until 1969 in Kalimantan. How many people were killed? How many mostly left-leaning people were killed? The numbers range between 500,000 to 680,000 by the government fact-finding team, up to 3 million by a former Special Forces commander. What is the real number? We don't know yet. Pembunuhan massal, ya itu pasti. Ya. Ada begitu banyak orang yang yang uh, dibunuh, uh, hilang, ditangkap kemudian dibuang, uh, dan juga selama waktu yang cukup lama menderita gitu. Uh, karena mereka memang PKI uh, atau terkait dengan PKI atau berkeluarga dengan PKI atau sebetulnya korban saja gitu ya karena. Uh, mereka nggak terlibat politik, tapi dalam situasi yang begitu tegang, ya begitu apa namanya uh, dinamis, uh, orang ini menjadi uh, korban ya dari orang yang kemudian memanipulasi keadaan ya, dengan menuduh orang lain gitu. sampai kemudian peristiwa 65, gitu ya dan kemudian kemunculan orde baru mengkonsolidasi kekuasaan militer dan praktis setelah itu kita melihat proses militerisasi. 
ya jadi birokrasi uh, istilahnya waktu itu dihijaukan um, paradigma atau pandangan militer masuk ke dalam berbagai macam bidang ya mulai dari bisnis pendidikan dan seterusnya ya, kita pernah punya mendikbud uh, militer after Soeharto took over he made the military to be the ruling government in Indonesia he pacified political parties he quote unquote simplified political parties into three political parties only and he installed military men to be parliament members uh, 20% from the national level provincial level uh, city and regency level that that happened of course without any election and also he militarized many civilian positions regions governors Mayors, they are all military officers. Suharto's obsession with order saw the military in control of both socio-political and security roles. The military's dual function was first introduced during a period of martial law under Sukarno in 1957. It was further expanded by Suharto and his authoritarian new order regime to help advance his political interests and keep him in power. It was the during the Suharto time, military was hijacked for his political interests. Therefore, uh, Suharto used military to expand, to ensure uh, his political positions. So no doubt that uh, he also asked the military to do things that might harm its own people. So therefore, we are seeing a number of uh, human rights abuses, either in Aceh, either in Papua, either in in the in East Timor, also against so-called kelompok kanan, the right threat, you know, coming from the Islamist group. So Soeharto hijacked the military to for his own purposes. Ketika Pak Harto naik dan selama era Orde Baru, itu adalah era perang dingin, nah, sehingga superpower itu hanya sibuk uh, di dalam kontestasi di antara mereka. Negara dunia ketiga itu di, uh, mereka tidak gubris uh, ada urusan masalah-masalah nasional silahkan selesaikan sendiri pemberontakan um, uh, itu uh, diatasi dengan uh, cara militer under Suharto's authoritarian regime power was almost absolute a general election was held in 1971 but only to maintain a veneer of democracy power was concentrated within the executive, particularly the president. He turned to the Golka party as his main political machinery to spearhead his government's election campaign. In actual fact, the party was nothing more than a parliamentary rubber stamp for his 32-year rule. Although a general election was held roughly every five years from 1971, Suharto's Golka party's political dominance was unparalleled. Under the New Order government, the country's legislature, or the People's Consultative Assembly, were filled with 207 Suharto appointees. Another 276 seats were set aside for officers from the armed forces. What he did was he utilized the military as his personal tool. He used that to prolong his longevity in office. This was not the TNI as conceptualized during the Sukarno era. If we go back to uh, General Nasution uh, and the uh, Jalan Tengah Tentara, or the military's middle way back in 1958, uh, the, the military was never keen on uh, having a political role. It wanted to be um, above the political forces uh, because the, the fear was that the civilian politicians would draw them into politics and as a consequence compromise their military role. Uh, so in this context, right, uh, what Suharto did was uh, undermine the military uh, quite significantly. Uh, so I would uh, uh, take the view that the TNI under Suharto was undermined to, to some extent. Um, from a local perspective, you know, because 
when, when, the, when the TNI became a tool of the regime, it became very brutal and engaged in uh, a, a lot of human rights uh, uh, violations. President Suharto's iron fist rule helped bring about three decades of stability to Indonesia. And that enabled him to embark on an era of unprecedented economic growth for the country. But Suharto was also known for his ruthless repression, unresolved human rights abuses, and corruption that benefited his family and his cronies. And he finally lost his grip on power 33 years later, when a regional economic crisis hit the country with a devastating force. Untuk menyatakan berhenti dari jabatan saya sebagai Presiden Republik Indonesia. Seventy-three-year-old Bejo Untung spent nine years in various detention centers and prisons in the 1970s. He was arrested on suspicion of being a communist sympathizer. Although he spent almost a decade in prison, he was never charged or tried in an open court for his alleged crime. During his long incarceration, he forced himself to eat mice, snakes, lizards, and snails in order to survive. He also watched in horror as his fellow detainees endured daily physical and mental abuses. Many were also subjected to forced labor. Malam pertama, saya mendengar teriakan dan ceritan orang-orang yang disiksa di malam hari. Ada suara tendangan, suara pukulan, suara ceritan, ampun, aduh. Dan banyak hal. itu mengerikan sekali. Dan pagi harinya saya melihat banyak tahanan yang sudah berdarah darah dengan pakai uh, dengan muka yang sudah memar begitu. Banyak dia punya kulitnya sudah dibakar bakar sama uh, puntung rokok begitu. Banyak banyak sana gitu. Itu yang terjadi di Kalong. Dan saya di Kalong tiba gilirannya saya disiksa. Disiksa dalam rangka mencari informasi dari saya. Itu sehingga banyak tahanan politik yang kelaparan. Dan banyak juga karena ada siksaan yang memang sampai bunuh diri. Bejo's nightmare began in October 1965. He was only 17 years old then, a student at a school for teachers in central Java. After General Suharto crushed a coup attempt blamed on the Indonesian Communist Party, or PKI, a wave of arrests and killings swept through Indonesia. Up to a million Indonesians were estimated to have been killed due to their affiliation with the PKI. Also killed were those accused of having leftist sympathies. After his father was arrested, Bejo decided to escape to Jakarta. For five years, he managed to evade arrest and survived by selling newspapers. But his luck soon ran out. He was arrested in 1970 while working at a department store. Rupa-rupanya, saya ditangkap hanya karena saya IP, Ikatan Pemuda Pelajar Indonesia, sebagai organisasi yang dianggap organisasi yang pro terhadap PKI. Ya, 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 benar. Jadi, ini satu kambing hitam, alasan yang tidak masuk akal, Ya, dan itu bagi saya tidak bisa saya terima. Ya. Hanya untuk kepentingan ambisi kekuasaannya akhirnya merugikan dan menghancurkan kita, orang yang tidak bersalah. Dan ingat, Mbak, korbannya itu di kalangan ilmuwan itu sangat banyak juga. Yang dosen, yang ahli nuklir, itu luar biasa. Pintar-pintar, itu kan percuma jadinya. Dan waktu itu tahun 65 banyak orang yang kita kehilangan orang-orang yang pandai lah itu. Kami sangat prihatin. Dan mereka sudah pada sudah pada meninggal. 
The elimination of communists and the establishment of a more repressive government, however, helped bring political stability to Indonesia. The growth of discontent was quickly dealt with through the ruthless use of the military intelligence apparatus. Even Muslim extremists were brutally suppressed during his rule, giving little room for radical ideas to grow. The stability that Suharto had created had helped Indonesia and the region to grow and prosper at a much faster speed. If you look at it from the point of view of development, Indonesia was counted as one of the Asian ti Asian ti tigers, one of the you know economic miracles in Asia. Indonesia is, uh, was regarded as a natural leader in, in Southeast Asia, it's a natural reason ASEAN, Indonesia is respected uh, on the global stage. Uh, you know, uh, a leading member of uh, uh, the non-aligned movement, uh, Group 77, and, and, and so on and so forth, you know. So Indonesia uh, was respected at, at the time. And, and I think that we need to give credit where credit is due. Political Indonesia is regarded as stable, as a good uh, a place for investment, and regarded to be a positive actor in regional politics as, as well as in, in, in wider one. The cost, of course, is that for political stability, uh, that political stability came at the cost of uh, very strict political control. Uh, this, uh, political liberty, civil liberties were very much uh, under restrictions. Suryo Pratomo is Indonesia's ambassador to Singapore. He's also a former journalist who witnessed Indonesia's transformation during Suharto's rule. Kalau kita lihat zaman Orde Baru, kita tidak bisa melepaskan mengenai sosok Presiden Soeharto sebagai orang punya latar belakang militer dan kemudian merasakan bagaimana apa politisasi itu membuat Indonesia kemudian tertinggal dan bahkan apa masuk dalam perangkap kemiskinan yang ingin dilakukan oleh uh, Presiden Soeharto ketika itu adalah bagaimana meningkatkan uh, kehidupan masyarakatnya. Nah, Pak Harto sangat menyadari kunci untuk membuat dan menjalankan pembangunan itu adalah stabilitas. Within a short period of time, with the help of the military, Suharto was able to consolidate his power. Separatist movements in Aceh and Papua were suppressed by long-running military operations. In 1975, Indonesian troops invaded East Timor and annexed the region to become the country's 27th province in 1976. The invasion was never recognized by the United Nations. Politically, Suharto also merged Islamic parties into one and forced them to adopt the state ideology, Pancasila instead of Islam. During Suharto time, you know, Suharto was very tough against any institutions, any organizations, or any movement, including coming from the Islamists, uh, because uh, for the because Suharto wanted to have uh, everyone, you know, like uh, embrace Pancasila, embrace nationalism. So, but for the Islamists, they don't want to do that. So they they, they see that as, uh, have uh, by having Pancasila as their, you know, ideology will diminish their influence among their network, especially among among the Islamists. So we are we are we we witness the brutality of a military try to quell the Islamists. Although Suharto was able to keep the growth of Muslim militancy in check and the economy humming, corruption was rampant at all levels of society. Indonesian business culture revolved around kickbacks and bribes. During that time, you know, from the mid-80s onward, uh, the children of Suharto also grew up and they started to become interested and involved in business. And, you know, the scandals of mega corruptions and, and you know, the KKN became a major issue. By the end of 1980s, early 1990s, we already began to hear disgruntlement, criticisms towards the military from among the senior generals, uh, junior the tribe generals, as well as well civil society, say, you know, the military has lost its elan, you know, it's no longer seen as a savior of the people, as a guardian of the state, but they were seen to be, uh, you know, a, a, a tool, an enforcer 
for the Suharto's personal rule and his family's, you know, uh, business interests. And 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 that that also began, you know, self criticism within the military, and 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 uh, so th that actually preceded the, uh, uh, you know, the financial crisis. The Asian financial crisis in 1998 eventually dealt a severe blow to the Indonesian economy. The Indonesian rupiah lost 82% of its value to the US dollar. Its GDP fell by more than 13% in 1998. Unemployment rose sharply, wages eroded, prices of basic commodities skyrocketed as inflation levels soared. Soon, President Suharto's government lost its legitimacy to govern as anti-government demonstrations brought the nation to its knees. Amid the social unrest, the president stepped down in May 1998. Pak Harto sebetulnya juga punya aspirasi untuk uh, menyempurnakan tatanan Indonesia. Uh, tetapi memang lambat, sehingga akhirnya overtaken by events. Tetapi reformasi-reformasi uh, sedikit-sedikit itu juga sudah, sudah dilaksanakan itu. Nah, uh, tapi ini terlalu lambat yang pada akhirnya krisis moneter uh, sebagai penyebab ut uh, utamanya. Sama sebetulnya seperti uh, Orde Lama juga Bung Karno, uh, ekonomi terpuruk. Uh, dan uh, akhirnya uh, karena kekuatan internasional itu sudah begitu dominan uh, Presiden Soeharto terdesak untuk mengundurkan diri. 23 years after Soeharto stepped down, Bedjo is still seeking justice. Until today, he remains worried about the prospect that the military may return to politics one day. Ditambah lagi juga Siapa sangka itu Soeharto akhirnya juga lengser begitu, oleh kiraan mahasiswa kan. Nah, jadi saya tetap beroptimis, ya, meskipun kadang-kadang melihat kondisinya seperti sekarang cukup berat. Ya. Cukup berat, karena apa? Militer masih selalu ingin mencari porsi di dalam kekuasaan. The fall of Soeharto also led to the downfall of the authoritarian, military-dominated New Order regime. It also ushered in a new era of democracy in Indonesia. But after being part of the political and economic establishments for decades, can the military simply let go of its power and influence in Indonesia? Will it be able to make a political comeback one day? Made 1998, Asia's longest serving leader, Suharto, tendered his resignation as president of Indonesia. It took place in the midst of the worst financial crisis in the region. Power was handed over to his successor, BJ Habibi. Mr. Habibi took up the mantle of leadership during a turbulent period in Indonesia's political history. He was tasked with the responsibility of steering the country out of the economic crisis. And that included, among others, bringing inflation down from more than 80% and stabilizing the rupiah currency, which had lost half of its value. Mr. Habibi was also under strong public pressure to introduce democratic reforms after 32 years of authoritarian rule. Dewi Fortuna Anwar, who was then an advisor to President B.J. Habibi, knew all too well the challenges facing the Habibi administration at that time. The strong anti-military sentiment had also made his task a lot tougher. 
Habibi period is a transition from authoritarian re uh, regime uh, to democracy, is clearly it's a very difficult period for the military because the main uh, object that is being reformed is clearly the military. Uh, a lot of the protests were aimed against the militaries, you know, at the dual functions of the military, the, uh, you know, the uh, human rights abuses, uh, and those, you know, very, very uh, strict political control, given the fact that the new order period was dominated by the military. Uh, clearly, the Habibi period is a very uncomfortable period when the military was very much on the defensive. The new paradigm was really an attempt to, uh, for, the, uh, for the military to withdraw from its political role. So it, it at one full swoop, eliminated uh, a, a large number of political positions. And uh, the TNI uh, then uh, adopted uh, a posture where it uh, decided that it would be a professional military force. Uh, in the past, it was both a defence and security institution as well as a socio-political force. So that socio-political part has been excised, liquidated in, in, uh, in that sense. So uh, this, is, uh, this is very uh, a very different uh, sort of situation as compared to, to, say, other examples in Southeast Asia. I think more likely uh, the ones that we would look at is Myanmar and uh, Thailand, you see, where, you do, where there hasn't been that break. President Habibi, however, held on to power for just 17 months. Still, he was able to introduce critical reforms in the country. For example, he ordered the release of political prisoners and dismantled the restrictions on press freedom. Habibi also agreed to a referendum on East Timor's independence, a former Portuguese colony which Indonesia had annexed in 1976. He also paved the way for direct elections in the country, allowing for the rise of leaders who were democratically elected by the people. For example, Abdurrahman Wahid, or Gus Dur, Megawati Sukarno Putri, Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono, and most recently, President Joko Widodo. He also set the foundation for an end of the dual function of the military in the country. One of the uh, first target of reform is to end the dual function of the military. So from, from the very beginning, uh, the, uh, the, the first extraordinary meeting of the MPR uh, in 1998, uh, in November 1998, uh, uh, one of the issue was, you know, uh, because we did not have the law, the new law uh, that uh, put the military out of domestic security yet. But there, you know, the, uh, the role of the military in parliament was already being reduced drastically. Uh, and then, uh, you know, and, and throughout that, that, uh, that uh, transition period, uh, various uh, regulations were put in place uh, to, you know, wind down uh, the role of the military. I think what people want to see is a professional uh, military, uh, the military that is uh, capable uh, uh, handling the security threat, especially the, the, the threat that coming from outside the country. Uh, we like to see uh, the military in uniform. We, we like to see our military to have uh, the modern equipment. We like to see that they uh, can match the military uh, in other countries in terms of the capabilities, in terms of uh, 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 skills and techniques in war, but I don't think the Indonesian people want the military uh, involved in politics again. 23 years after thousands of students took to the streets of Jakarta to demand the resignation of Suharto, the military has now regained its credibility. A poll shows that the military is the most trusted institution in Indonesia today. It has stayed out of politics and has never attempted to get back into it, transforming itself into a professional institution which remains subservient to civilian rule. 
That's probably the reason why former military figures are still being relied upon to bring stability to the country, especially on security matters. Indonesia's sixth president, Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono, for one, was a former general in the armed forces. There are also a number of former senior military officials serving in President Widodo's cabinet today. Among them, Defense Minister Prabowo Subianto, who ran against President Jokowi and lost in the last two general elections. Former Commander-in-Chief of the Army, Mr. Wiranto also served in Jokowi's administration as Coordinating Minister for Political, Legal and Security from 2016 to 2019. He was entrusted with the post in spite of his tainted human rights record in the days leading up to the East Timor independence. The other influential figure is Mr. Luhut Binsar Panjaitan. He is a former Suharto-era four-star Special Forces General and is now serving as Coordinating Minister for Maritime Affairs and Investment. People love the TNI. Maybe they love, what should I say, maybe the style or the, you know, the discipline and the, the you know, because they, they believe that the TNI is always Pancasila or ideology or something like that. So if you look at now the cabinet of uh, President Jokowi, there are several uh, retired generals. Also. This is not, yeah, what should I say, representative for military, but this is by professional uh, perspective, President pick up that uh, retired general to be his uh, member of cabinet. So again, in this country going to be move forward like this and not necessarily military have to be a president, but one day, or oh, you cannot afford also to say if one general, retired general, has a very good reputation and people love them, they will elect him to be a, a next president. For why not? It's possible also. I think we leave it to the to the democracy. We leave it to the people. But again, we don't differentiate the military or civilian in this country. We leave it as is to the to the democracy of Indonesia. I think it is no doubt that current administrations try to still maintain some of the Suharto legacy, especially the way they deal with the Islamist the threat. They want to be seen as a strong, they want to be seen as the bastions of Indonesians uh, nationalism, you know, nationalism, you know, so they don't want to flirt into specific they don't want to flood into Islamism, for say. So therefore, they, they, they have to demonstrate their stand accents, you know, their stand commitment to the unity of Indonesia. If you look at a lot of the political parties, they look uh, at the military as uh, a source of leadership. In fact, they quoted former military officers, generals and so on, because of uh, their experience, you know, their experience in management, uh, their, you know, their leadership quality, and also because a lot of them were already well known. So a lot of this, you know, Islamic political parties, secular political parties, a lot of political parties, they quoted different senior officers. And so it's not surprising if you look at, uh, you know, the, uh, the cabinet of Joko Widodo, uh, maybe because he's a civilian and feels the need uh, to have some strong guy. The reality is, by law, the military cannot be involved in politics. Soldiers are also barred from voting in elections. The same can't be said about some neighboring countries in this region. Thailand has had 12 successful coups since the 1932 revolution, which ended the absolute monarchy in the country. Today, the military plays a dominant role in politics. The 250-seat Upper House Senate is entirely appointed by the ruling junta. They also have the power to choose the next prime minister. In Myanmar, prior to the February 1st coup, 25% of the parliamentary seats were reserved for the military. They also had a veto power to block any amendments to the constitution. Today, the country is led exclusively by a military junta. If in Indonesia, the military has detached itself from politics, the reverse is true for countries like Thailand and Myanmar. 
But will the Indonesian military make a political comeback and establish control over the government again? I cannot see the TNI attempting to do or engage in the same sort of activities as we've seen in Myanmar or Thailand, principally because I think the mindset of the TNI officer is changing. You know, there is a desire to be more professional uh, uh, in their outlook. Um, more importantly uh, is the TNI's own uh, vision of modernizing its uh, military, making it relevant uh, to meet Indonesia's needs uh, in the current era. Uh, but more importantly, you know, we live in a, a different age now. You know, social media is so, um, uh, so prevalent in, in Indonesia with uh, the use of Facebook and Twitter. You know, it, uh, a TNI uh, soldier cannot engage in any human rights violation without it being captured on the YouTube uh, or through any of these uh, media, you know. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, Indonesian civil society, uh, Indonesian media ha have, be have a tremendous role to play, you know. So there are countervailing forces now in Indonesia um, that exist to to prevent the, out, uh, the possibility of, of a coup. If you want to move this country forward, so they are much mature compared to uh, before 1998. So I think the TNI understand that we should uh, respect to the democracy. That's the democracy that we love it today. And we have to defend and protect our own democracy, not necessarily like other countries' democracy. Since its founding in 1945, the army has always been seen as the guardian of the nation. But it then decided not to share power with the civilian authority during the leadership of former strongman Suharto, who then expanded the military's role in politics while putting officers in important positions in the government. His downfall in the wake of a deep economic crisis had exposed huge flaws of the military-dominated government. The 32-year tenure was also marred by massive corruption and nepotism, prompting civilian politicians to never again subordinate themselves to military authority. But today, the military is regarded as a partner, which works hand-in-hand -hand with the government in ensuring stability and prosperity in the country. Instead of dictatorial rule in the past era, freedom, civil liberty, and democracy are now seen as the only route to the future success of the world's most populous Muslim nation.